Chapter 12 of Thrilling Narratives of Mutiny, Murder, and Piracy. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mary Maxwell. Thrilling Narratives of Mutiny, Murder, and Piracy by Anonymous. Chapter 12 Shipwreck of the French Frigate Medusa on the Western Coast of Africa by Madame Dard, one of the sufferers. In the year 1816, an expedition was fitted out by the French to go and resume possession of Senegal, which had been restored to them. My father was reinstated in his place of resident attorney, and taking with him his family, repaired immediately to Rochefort to embark on board the Medusa frigate. Early on the morning of the 12th of June, we were on our way to the boats that were to convey us on board the Medusa, which was riding at anchor off the island of Aix, distant about four leagues from Rochefort. The field through which we passed was sown with corn. Wishing before I left our beautiful France to make my farewell to the flowers, and whilst our family went leisurely forward to the place where we were to embark upon the Charente, I crossed the furrows and gathered a few blue bottles and poppies, we soon arrived at the place of embarkation, where we found some of our fellow passengers who, like myself, seemed casting a last look to heaven, whilst they were yet on the French soil. We embarked, however, and left these happy shores. In descending the tortuous course of the Charente, contrary winds so impeded our progress that we did not reach the Medusa till the morrow, having taken twenty-four hours in sailing four leagues. At length we mounted the deck of the Medusa, of painful memory. When we got on board we found our berths not provided for us, consequently we were obliged to remain indiscriminately together till the next day. Our family, which consisted of nine persons, was placed in a berth near the main deck. As the wind was still contrary, we lay at anchor for seventeen days. On the 17th of June, at four in the morning, we set sail, as did the whole expedition, which consisted of the Medusa frigate, the Lorry store ship, the Argus brig, and the Echo corvette. The wind being favorable, we soon lost sight of the greed fields of La Anus. At six in the morning, however, the island of Rhys still appeared above the horizon. We fixed our eyes upon it with regret, to salute for the last time our dear country. Now, imagine the ship borne aloft and surrounded by huge mountains of water, which at one moment tossed it in the air and in another plunged it into the profound abyss. The waves, raised by a stormy northwest breeze, came dashing in a horrible manner against the sides of our ship. I knew not whether it was a presentiment of the misfortune which menaced us that had made me pass the preceding night in the most cruel ineptitude. In my agitation I sprang upon deck and contemplated with horror the frigate winging its way upon the waters. The winds pressed against the sails with great violence, strained and whistled among the cordage, and the great bulk of wood seemed to split every time the surge broke upon its sides. On looking a little out to sea I perceived at no great distance on our right all the other ships of the expedition, which quieted me very much. Towards ten in the morning the wind changed. Immediately an appalling cry was heard, concerning which the passengers, as well as myself, were equally ignorant. The whole crew were in motion. Some climbed the rope ladders and seemed to perch on the extremities of the yards. Others mounted to the highest parts of the mast, these bellowing and pulling the cordages in cadence, those crying, swearing, whistling, and filling the air with barbarous and unknown sounds. The officer on duty, in his turn, roaring out these words, starboard, larboard, hoist, luff, tack, which the helmsman repeated in the same tone. All this hubbub, however, produced its effect. The yards were turned on their pivots, the sails set, the cordage tightened, and the unfortunate sea boys, having received their lessons, descended to the deck. Everything remained tranquil, except that the waves still roared and the masts continued their cracking. However, the sails were swelled, the wind less violent though favorable, and the mariner, while he caroled his song, said we had a noble voyage. During several days we did indeed enjoy a delightful passage. All the ships of the expedition still kept together, but at length the breeze became changeable, and they all disappeared. 
the echo however still kept in sight and persisted in accompanying us as if to guide us on our route the wind becoming more favorable we held due south sailing at the rate of sixty-two leagues a day the sea was so fine and our journey so rapid that i began to think it nearly as agreeable to travel by sea as by land but my illusion was not of long duration on the twenty eighth of june at six in the morning we discovered the peak of teneriffe towards the south the summit of whose cone seemed lost in the clouds we were then distant about two leagues which we made in less than a quarter of an hour at ten o'clock we brought to before the town of st croix several officers got to leave to go on shore to procure refreshments while these gentlemen were away a certain passenger member of the self-instituted philanthropic society of cape verde suggested that it was very dangerous to remain where we were adding that he was well acquainted with the country and had navigated in all these latitudes m leroy lachemares captain of the medusa believing the pretended knowledge of the intriguing richefort gave him the command of the frigate various officers of the navy represented to the captain how shameful it was to put such confidence in a stranger and they would never obey a man who had no character as a commander the captain despised these wise remonstrances and using his authority commanded the pilots and all the crew to obey richefort saying he was king since the orders of the king were that they should obey him immediately the impostor desirous of displaying his great skill in navigation made them change the route for no purpose but that of showing his skill in manoeuvring the ship every instant he changed the tack went came and returned and approached the very reefs as if to brave them in short he beat about so much that the sailors at length refused to obey him saying boldly that he was a vile impostor but it was done the man had gained the confidence of captain lachemaris who ignorant of navigation himself was doubtless glad to get someone to undertake his duty but it must be told that this blind inept confidence was the sole cause of the loss of the medusa frigate as well as all the crimes consequent upon it towards three in the afternoon those officers who went on shore in the morning returned on board loaded with vegetables fruits and flowers they laughed heartily at the maneuvers that had been going on during their absence which doubtless did not please the captain who flattered himself he had already found in his pilot richfort a good and able seaman such were his words at four in the afternoon we took a southerly direction m richefort then beaming with exultation for having as he said saved the medusa from certain shipwreck continued to give his pernicious counsels to the captain persuading him that he had been often employed to explore the shores of africa and that he was perfectly well acquainted with the arguin bank the journals of the twenty ninth and thirtieth afford nothing very remarkable the hot winds from the desert of sahara began to be felt which told us we approached the tropic indeed the sun at noon seemed suspended perpendicularly above our heads a phenomenon which few among us had ever seen on the first of july we recognized cape bojador and then saw the shores of sahara towards ten in the morning they set about the frivolous ceremony which the sailors have invented for the purpose of exacting something from those passengers who have never crossed the line during the ceremony the frigate doubled cape barbas hastening to its destruction captain lachemares very good-humouredly presided at this species of baptism while his dear richefort promenaded the forecastle and looked with indifference upon a shore bristling with dangers however that may be all passed on well nay it may even be said that the farce was well played off but the route which we pursued soon made us forget the short-lived happiness we had experienced every one began to observe the sudden change which had taken place in the color of the sea as we ran upon the bank in shallow water a general murmur arose among the passengers and officers of the navy they were far from partaking in the blind confidence of the captain on the second of july at five in the morning the captain was persuaded that a large cloud which was discovered in the direction of cape blanco was that cape itself after this pretended discovery they ought to have steered to the west for about fifty leagues to have gained sea room to double with certainty the arguin bank moreover they ought to have conformed to the instructions the minister of marine had given to the ships which set out for senegal the other part of the expedition 
from having followed these instructions, arrived in safety at their destination. During the preceding night, the echo, which hitherto accompanied the Medusa, made several signals, but being replied to with contempt, abandoned us. Towards ten in the morning, the danger which threatened us was again represented to the captain, and he was strongly urged, if he wished to avoid the Arguin Bank, to take a westerly course, but the advice was again neglected, and he despised the predictions. One of the officers of the frigate, from having wished to expose the intriguing Richefort, was put under arrest. My father, who had already twice made the voyage to Senegal, and who with various persons was persuaded they were going right upon the bank, also made his observations to the unfortunate pilot. His advice was no better received than those of Messrs. Reynaud, Espieu, Medeau, and Richefort, in the sweetest tone, replied, my dear, we know our business. Attend to yours and be quiet. I have already twice passed the Arguin Bank. I have sailed upon the Red Sea, and you see I am not drowned. What reply could be made to such a preposterous speech? My father, seeing it was impossible to get our route changed, resolved to trust to Providence to free us from our danger, and descended to our cabin, where he sought to dissipate his fears in the oblivion of sleep. At noon on the 2nd of July, soundings were taken. M. Maudet, ensign of the watch, was convinced we were upon the edge of the Arguin Bank. The captain said to him, as well as to everyone, that there was no cause for, of alarm. In the meanwhile, the wind blowing with great violence impelled us nearer and nearer to the danger which menaced us. A species of stupor overpowered all our spirits, and everyone preserved a mournful silence, as if they were persuaded we would soon touch the bank. The color of the water entirely changed, a circumstance even remarked by the ladies. About three in the afternoon, being in 1930 north latitude and 1945 west longitude, a universal cry was heard upon deck. All declared they saw sand rolling among the ripple of the sea. The captain in an instant ordered to sound. The line gave eighteen fathoms, but on a second sounding it only gave six. He at last saw his error, and hesitated no longer on changing the route, but it was too late. A strong concussion told us the frigate had struck. Terror and consternation were instantly depicted on every face. The crew stood motionless, the passengers in utter despair. In the midst of this general panic, cries of vengeance were heard against the principal author of our misfortunes, wishing to throw him overboard but some generous persons interposed and endeavored to calm their spirits by diverting their attention to the means of our safety. The confusion was already so great that McPointsignon, commandant of the troop, struck my sister Caroline a severe blow, doubtless thinking it was one of his soldiers. At this crisis my father was buried in profound sleep, but he quickly awoke, the cries and the tumult upon deck having informed him of our misfortunes. He poured out a thousand reproaches on those whose ignorance and boasting had been so disastrous to us. However, they set about the means of averting our danger. The officers, with an altered voice, issued their orders, expecting every moment to see the ship go in pieces. They strove to lighten her, but the sea was very rough and the current strong. Much time was lost in doing nothing. They only pursued half measures, and all of them unfortunately failed. When it was discovered that the danger of the Medusa was not so great as was at first supposed, various persons proposed to transport the troops to the island of Arguin, which was conjectured to be not far from the place where we lay aground. Others advised to take us all successively to the coast of the desert of Sahara, by the means of our boats, and with provisions sufficient to form a caravan, to reach the island of St. Louis at Senegal. The events which afterwards ensued proved this plan to have been the best, and which would have been crowned with success. Unfortunately, it was not adopted. M. Schmaltz, the governor, suggested the making of a raft of sufficient size to carry two hundred men, with provisions, which latter plan was seconded by the two officers of the frigate, and put in execution. The fatal raft was then begun to be constructed, which would, they said, carry provisions for everyone masts, planks, boards, and cordage were thrown overboard. Two officers were charged with the framing of these together. Large barrels were emptied and placed at the angles of the machine, and the workmen were taught to say, 
that the passengers would be in greater security there and more at their ease than in the boats however it was forgotten to erect rails everyone supposed and with reason that those who had given the plan of the raft had had no design of embarking upon it themselves when it was completed the two chief officers of the frigate publicly promised that all the boats would tow it to the shore of the desert and when there stores of provisions and firearms would be given to us to form a caravan to take us all to senegal why was not this plan executed why were these promises sworn before the french flag made in vain but it is necessary to draw a veil over the past i will only add that if these promises had been fulfilled every one would have been saved and that in spite of the detestable egotism of certain personages humanity would not now have had to deplore the scenes of horror consequent on the wreck of the medusa on the third of july the efforts were renewed to disengage the frigate but without success we then prepared to quit her the sea became very rough and the wind blew with great violence nothing now was heard but the plaintive and confused cries of a multitude consisting of more than four hundred persons who seeing death before their eyes deplored their hard fate in bitter lamentations on the fourth there was a glimpse of hope at the hour the tide flowed the frigate being considerably lightened by all that had been thrown overboard was found nearly afloat and it is very certain if on that day they had thrown the artillery into the water the medusa would have been saved but M. Lachemaris said he would not thus sacrifice the king's cannon, as if the frigate did not belong to the king also. However, the sea ebbed, and the ship sinking into the sand deeper than ever, made them relinquish that on which depended our last ray of hope. On the approach of night, the fury of the winds redoubled, and the sea became very rough. The frigate then received some tremendous concussions, and the water rushed into the hold in a most terrific manner but the pumps would not work we had now no alternative but to abandon her for the frail boats which any single wave might overwhelm frightful gulfs environed us mountains of water raised their liquid summits in the distance how were we to escape so many dangers whither could we go what hospitable land would receive us on its shores my thoughts then reverted to our beloved country then starting suddenly from my reverie i exclaimed o oh, terrible condition that black and boundless sea resembles the eternal night which will engulf us all those who surround me seem yet tranquil but that fatal calm will soon be succeeded by the most frightful torments fools what had we to find in senegal to make us trust the most perfidious of elements did france not afford every necessary for our happiness happy yes thrice happy they who never set foot on a foreign soil great god succor all these unfortunate beings save our unhappy family my father perceived my distress but how could he console me what words could calm my fears and place me above the apprehensions of those dangers to which we were exposed how in a word could i assume a serene appearance when friends parents and all that was most dear to me were in all human probability on the very verge of destruction alas my fears were but too well founded for i soon perceived that although we were the only ladies besides the mrs schmaltz who formed a part of the governor's suit they had the barbarity of intending our family to embark upon the raft where were only soldiers sailors and planters of cape verde and some generous officers who had not the honor if it could be accounted one of being considered among the ignorant confidants of messrs schmaltz and lachemaris my father indignant at a proceeding so indecorous swore we would not embark upon the raft and that if we were not judged worthy of a place in one of the six boats he would himself his wife and children remain on board the wreck of the frigate the tone in which he spoke these words was that of a man resolute to avenge any insult that might be offered to him the governor of senegal doubtless fearing the world would one day reproach him for his inhumanity decided we should have a place in one of the boats this having in some measure quieted our fears concerning our unfortunate situation i was desirous of taking some repose but the uproar among the crew was so great i could not obtain it 
Towards midnight, a passenger came to inquire of my father if we were disposed to depart. He replied we had been forbid to go yet. However, we were soon convinced that a great part of the crew and various passengers were secretly preparing to set off in the boats. A conduct so perfidious could not fail to alarm us, especially as we perceived among those so eager to embark unknown to us several who had promised, but a little while before, not to go without us. M. Schmaltz, to prevent that which was going on upon deck, instantly rose to endeavor to quiet their minds, but the soldiers had already assumed a threatening attitude, and holding cheap the words of their commander, swore they would fire upon whosoever attempted to depart in a clandestine manner. The firmness of these brave men produced the desired effect, and all was restored to order. The governor returned to his cabin, and those who were desirous of departing furtively were confused and covered with shame. The governor, however, was ill at ease, and as he had heard very distinctly certain energetic words which had been addressed to him, he judged it proper to assemble a council. All the officers and passengers being collected, M. Schmaltz there solemnly swore before them not to abandon the raft, and a second time promised that all the boats would tow it to the shore of the desert, where they would all be formed into a caravan. I confess this conduct of the governor greatly satisfied every member of our family, for we never dreamed he would deceive us, nor act in a manner contrary to what he had promised. About three in the morning, some hours after the meeting of the council, a terrible noise was heard in the powder room. It was the helm which was broken. All who were sleeping were aroused by it. On going on deck, everyone was more and more convinced that the frigate was lost beyond all recovery. Alas, the wreck was for our family but the commencement of a horrible series of misfortunes. The two chief officers then decided with one accord that all should embark at six in the morning and abandon the ship to the mercy of the waves. After the decision followed a scene the most whimsical and at the same time the most melancholy that can be well conceived. To have a more distinct idea of it, let the reader transport himself in imagination to the midst of the liquid plains of the ocean. Let him then picture to himself a multitude of all classes, of every age, tossed about at the mercy of the waves upon a dismasted vessel, foundered and half submerged. Let him not forget these are thinking beings with a certain prospect before them of having reached the goal of their existence. Separated from the rest of the world by a boundless sea, and having no place of refuge but the wreck of a grounded vessel, the multitude addressed at first their vows to heaven and forgot for a moment all earthly concerns. Then suddenly starting from their lethargy, they began to look after their wealth, the merchandise they had in small ventures, utterly regardless of the elements which threatened them. The miser, thinking of the gold contained in his coffers, hastening to put it in a place of safety, either by sewing it into the lining of his clothes, or by cutting out for it a place in the waistband of his trousers. The smuggler was tearing his hair at not being able to save a chest of contraband which he had secretly got on board, and with which he had hoped to have gained two or three hundred per cent. Another, selfish to excess, was throwing overboard all his hidden money, and amusing himself by burning all his effects. A generous officer was opening his portmanteau, offering caps, stockings, and shirts to any who would take them. These had scarcely gathered together their various effects, when they learned that they could not take anything with them. Those were searching the cabin and storerooms to carry away everything that was valuable. Ship boys were discovering the delicate wines and fine liquors, which a wise foresight had placed in reserve. Soldiers and sailors were penetrating even into the spirit room, broaching casks, staving others, and drinking till they fell exhausted. Soon the tumult of the inebriated made us forget the roaring of the sea which threatened to engulf us. At last the uproar was at its height. The soldiers no longer listened to the voice of the captain. Some knit their brows and muttered oaths, but nothing could be done with those whom wine had rendered furious. Next, piercing cries mixed with doleful groans were heard. This was the signal of departure. At six o'clock on the morning of the fifth, a great part of the military were embarked upon the raft, which was already covered with a large sheet of foam. The soldiers were expressly prohibited from taking their arms. A young officer of infantry, 
whose brain seemed to be powerfully affected, put his horse beside the barricados of the frigate, and then, armed with two pistols, threatened to fire upon anyone who refused to go upon the raft. Forty men had scarcely descended when it sunk to the depth of about two feet. To facilitate the embarking of a greater number, they were obliged to throw over several barrels of provisions which had been placed upon it the day before. In this manner did this furious officer get about one hundred and fifty heaped upon that floating tomb, but he did not think of adding one more to the number by descending himself, as he ought to have done, but went peaceably away and placed himself in one of the best boats. There should have been sixty sailors upon the raft, and there were but about ten. A list had been made out on the fourth, assigning each his proper place, but this wise precaution being disregarded, every one pursued the plan he deemed the best for his own preservation. The precipitation with which they forced one hundred and fifty unfortunate beings upon the raft was such that they forgot to give them one morsel of biscuit. However, they threw towards them twenty-five pounds in a sack, while they were not far from the frigate, but it fell into the sea and was with difficulty recovered. During this disaster, the governor of Senegal, who was busied in the care of his own dear self, effeminately descended in an armchair into the barge, where were already various large chests, all kinds of provisions, his dearest friends, his daughter, and his wife. Afterwards, the captain's boat received twenty-seven persons, among whom were twenty-five sailors, good rowers, the shallop, commanded by M. Espieu, ensign of the ship, took forty-five passengers and put off. The boat, called the Senegal, took twenty-five, the pinnace thirty-three and the yawl, the smallest of the boats, took only ten. Almost all of the officers, the passengers, the mariners, the supernumeraries, were already embarked, all but our weeping family, who still remained upon the boards of the frigate, till some charitable souls would kindly receive us into a boat. Surprised at this abandonment, I instantly felt myself roused, and, calling with all my might to the officers of the boats, besought them to take our unhappy family along with them. Soon after, the barge, in which were the governor of Senegal and all his family, approached the Medusa, as if still to take some passengers, for there were but few in it. I made a motion to descend, hoping that the Mrs. Schmaltz, who had, till that day, taken a great interest in her family, would allow us a place in their boat. But I was mistaken. Those ladies, who had embarked in a mysterious incognito, had already forgotten us, and M. Lachamaris, who was still on the frigate, positively told me they would not embark along with us. Nevertheless, I ought to tell what we learned afterwards, that the officer who commanded the pinnace had received orders to take us in, but, as he was already a great way from the frigate, we were certain he had abandoned us. My father, however, hailed him, but he persisted on his way to gain the open sea. A short while afterwards we perceived a small boat among the waves, which seemed desirous to approach the Medusa. It was the yawl. When it was sufficiently near, my father implored the sailors who were in it to take us on board, and to carry us to the pinnace, where our family ought to be placed. They refused. He then seized a firelock, which lay by chance upon deck, and swore he would kill every one of them if they refused to take us, adding that it was the property of the king, and that he would have advantage from it as well as another. The sailors murmured, but durst not resist, and received all our family, which consisted of nine persons, viz. four children, our stepmother, my cousin, my sister Carolyn, my father, and myself. A small box, filled with valuable papers, which we wished to save, two bottles of ratafia, which we had endeavored to preserve amidst our misfortunes, were seized and thrown overboard by the sailors of the yawl, who told us we would find in the pinnace everything we could wish for our voyage. We had then only the clothes which covered us, never thinking of dressing ourselves in two suits, but the loss which affected us most was that of several MSS, at which my father had been laboring for a long while. Our trunks, our linen, and various chests of merchandise of great value, in a word, everything we possessed, was left in the Medusa. When we boarded the pinnace, the officer who commanded it began excusing himself for having set off without forewarning us, as he had been ordered, and said a thousand things in his justification. But without believing the half of his fine protestations, 
we felt very happy in having overtaken him, for it is most certain they had no intention of encumbering themselves with our unfortunate family. I say encumber, for it is evident that four children, one of whom was yet at the breast, were very indifferent beings to people who were actuated by a selfishness without all parallel. When we were seated in the longboat, my father dismissed the sailors with the all, telling them that he would ever gratefully remember their services. They speedily departed, but little satisfied with the good action they had done. My father, hearing their murmurs and the abuse they poured out against us, said, loud enough for all in the boat to hear, we are not surprised sailors are destitute of shame when their officers blush at being compelled to do a good action. The commandant of the boat feigned not to understand the reproaches conveyed in these words, and to divert our minds from brooding over our wrongs, endeavored to counterfeit the man of gallantry. All the boats were already far from the Medusa, when they were brought to, to form a chain in order to tow the raft. The barge, in which was the governor of Senegal, took the first tow, then all the other boats in succession joined themselves to that. M. Lachamaris embarked, although there yet remained upon the Medusa more than sixty persons. Then the brave and generous Espio, commander of the shallop, quitted the line of boats and returned to the frigate, with the intention of saving all the wretches who had been abandoned. They all sprung into the shallop, but it was at very much overloaded. Seventeen unfortunates preferred remaining on board, rather than expose themselves as well as their companions to certain death. But alas, the greater part afterwards fell victims to their fears or their devotion. Fifty-two days after they were abandoned, no more than three of them were alive, and those looked more like skeletons than men. They told that their miserable companions had gone afloat upon planks and hencoops, after having waited in vain forty-two days for the succor which had been promised them, and that all had perished. The shallop, carrying with difficulty all those she had saved from the Medusa, slowly rejoined the line of boats which towed the raft. M. Espiu earnestly besought the officers of the other boats to take some of them along with them, but they refused, alleging to the generous officer that he ought to keep them in his own boat, as he had gone for them himself. M. Espiu, finding it impossible to keep them all without exposing them to the utmost peril, steered right for a boat which I will not name. Immediately a sailor sprung from the shallop into the sea, and endeavored to reach it by swimming, and when he was about to enter it, an officer who possessed great influence pushed him back, and drawing his saber, threatened to cut off his hands, if he again made the attempt. The poor wretch regained the shallop, which was very near the pinnace, which we were in. My father supplicated M. Laperere, the officer of the boat, to receive him on board, and had his arms already out to catch him, when M. Laperere instantly let go the rope which attached us to the other boats, and tugged off with all his force. At that same instant every boat imitated our execrable example, and wishing to shun the approach of the shallop, which sought for assistance, stood off from the raft, abandoning in the midst of the ocean and to the fury of the waves the miserable mortals whom they had sworn to land on the shores of the desert. Scarcely had these cowards broken their oath when we saw the French flag flying upon the raft. The confidence of those unfortunate persons was so great that when they saw the first boat which had the tow removing from them, they all cried out, The rope is broken! The rope is broken! But when no attention was paid to their observation, they instantly perceived the treachery of the wretches who had left them so basely. Then the cries of Vive le Roy rose from the raft, as if the poor fellows were calling to their father for assistance, or as if they had been persuaded that, at that rallying word, the officers of the boats would return and not abandon their countrymen. The officers repeated the cry of Vive le Roy, without a doubt to insult them, but more particularly M. Lachamaris, who, assuming a martial attitude, waved his hat in the air. Alas, what availed these false professions? Frenchmen, menaced with the greatest peril, were demanding assistance with the cries of Vive le Roy, yet none were found sufficiently generous, nor sufficiently French, to go to aid them. After a silence of some minutes, horrible cries were heard. The air resounded with the groans, the lamentations, the imprecations of these wretched beings, and the echo of the sea frequently repeated, Alas, how cruel you are to abandon us! 
the raft already appeared to be buried under the waves and its unfortunate passengers immerse the fatal machine was drifted by currents far behind the wreck of the frigate without cable anchor mast sail or oars in a word without the smallest means of enabling them to save themselves each wave that struck it made them stumble in heaps on one another their feet getting entangled among the cordage and between the planks bereaved them of the faculty of moving maddened by these misfortunes suspended and adrift upon a merciless ocean they were soon tortured between the pieces of wood which formed the scaffold on which they floated the bones of their feet and their legs were bruised and broken every time the fury of the waves agitated the raft their flesh covered with contusions and hideous wounds dissolved as it were in the briny waves while the roaring flood around them was covered with their blood as the raft when it was abandoned was nearly two leagues from the frigate it was impossible these unfortunate persons could return to it they were soon after far out to sea these victims still appeared above their floating tomb and stretching out their supplicating hands toward the boats which fled from them seemed yet to invoke for the last time the names of the wretches who had deceived them O oh, horrid day a day of shame and reproach alas that the hearts of those who were so well acquainted with misfortune should have been so inaccessible to pity after witnessing that most inhumane scene and seeing they were insensible to the cries and lamentations of so many unhappy beings i felt my heart bursting with sorrow it seemed to me that the waves would overwhelm all these wretches and i could not suppress my tears my father exasperated to excess and bursting with rage at seeing so much cowardice and inhumanity among the officers of the boats began to regret that he had not accepted the place which had been assigned for us upon the fatal raft at least said he we would have died with the brave or would have returned to the wreck of the medusa and not have had the disgrace of saving ourselves with cowards although this produced no effect upon the officers it proved very fatal to us afterwards, for on our arrival at Senegal it was reported to the governor, and very probably was the principal cause of all those evils and vexations which we endured in that colony. End of chapter 12「Chapter thirteen of Thrilling Narratives of Mutiny, Murder, and Piracy. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mary Maxwell. Thrilling Narratives of Mutiny, Murder, and Piracy by Anonymous. Chapter thirteen. Wreck of the French Frigate Medusa on the Arguin Bank. Part two. Let us now turn our attention to the several situations of all those who were endeavoring to save themselves in the different boats, as well as to those left upon the wreck of the Medusa. We have already seen that the frigate was half sunk when it was deserted, presenting nothing but a hulk and wreck. Nevertheless, seventeen still remained upon it, and had food which, although damaged, enabled them to support themselves for a considerable time while the raft was abandoned to float at the mercy of the waves upon the vast surface of the ocean one hundred and fifty wretches were embarked upon it sunk to the depth of at least three feet on its forepart and on its poop immersed even to the middle what victuals they had were soon consumed or spoiled by the salt water and perhaps some as the waves hurried them along became food for the monsters of the deep Two only of all the boats which left the Medusa, and these with very few people in them, were provisioned with every necessary. These struck off with security and dispatch, but the condition of those who were in the shallop was but little better than those upon the raft. Their great number, their scarcity of provisions, their great distance from the shore, gave them the most melancholy anticipations of the future. Their worthy commander, M. Espew, had no other hope but of reaching the shore as soon as possible the other boats were less filled with people but they were scarcely better provisioned and as by a species of fatality the pinnace in which were our family was destitute of everything our provisions consisted of a barrel of biscuit and a tierce of water and to add to our misfortune 
the biscuit being soaked in the sea it was almost impossible to swallow one morsel of it each passenger in our boat was obliged to sustain his wretched existence with a glass of water which he could get only once a day to tell how this happened how this boat was so poorly supplied while there was abundance left upon the medusa is far beyond my power but it is at least certain that the greater part of the officers commanding the boats the shallop the pinnace the senegal boat and the yawl were persuaded when they quitted the frigate that they would not abandon the raft but that all the expedition would sail together to the coast of sahara that when there the boats would be again sent to the medusa to take provisions arms and those who were left there but it appears the chiefs had decided otherwise after abandoning the raft although scattered all the boats formed a little fleet and followed the same route all who were sincere hoped to arrive the same day at the coast of the desert and that every one would get on shore but messrs schmaltz and lachimaris gave orders to take the route for senegal this sudden change in the resolutions of the chiefs was like a thunderbolt to the officers commanding the boats having nothing on board but what was barely necessary to enable us to allay the cravings of hunger for one day we were all sensibly affected the other boats which like ourselves hoped to have got on shore at the nearest point were a little better provisioned than we were they had at least a little wine which supplied the place of other necessaries we then demanded some from them explaining our situation but none would assist us not even the captain who drinking to a kept mistress supported by two sailors swore he had not one drop on board we were next desirous of addressing the boat of the governor of senegal where we were persuaded were plenty of provisions of every kind such as oranges biscuit cakes comfits plums and even the finest liquors but my father opposed it so well was he assured we would not obtain anything we will now turn to the condition of those on the raft when the boats left them to themselves if all the boats had continued dragging the raft forward favored as we were by the breeze from the sea we would have been able to have conducted them to the shore in less than two days but an inconceivable fatality caused the generous plan to be abandoned which had been formed when the raft had lost sight of the boats a spirit of sedition began to manifest itself in furious cries they then began to regard one another with ferocious looks and to thirst for one another's flesh some one had already whispered of having recourse to that monstrous extremity and of commencing with the fattest and youngest a proposition so atrocious filled the brave captain dupont and his worthy lieutenant m le Hereux with horror and that courage which had so often supported them in the field of glory now forsook them among the first who fell under the hatchets of the assassins was a young woman who had been seen devouring the body of her husband when her turn was come she sought a little wine as a last favor then rose and without uttering a word threw herself into the sea captain dupont being described for having refused to partake of the sacrilegious viands with which the monsters were feeding on was saved by a miracle from the hands of the butchers scarcely had they seized him to lead him to the slaughter when a large pole which served in place of a mast fell upon his body and believing that his legs were broken they contented themselves by throwing him into the sea the unfortunate captain plunged and disappeared and they thought him already in another world providence however revived the strength of the unfortunate warrior he emerged under the beams of the raft and clinging with all his might holding his head above water he remained between two enormous pieces of wood while the rest of his body was hid in the sea after more than two hours of suffering captain dupont spoke in a low voice to his lieutenant who by chance was seated near the place of his concealment the brave le Heroux, with eyes glistening with tears believed he heard the voice and saw the shade of his captain and trembling was about to quit the place of horror oh wonderful he saw a head which seemed to draw its last sigh he recognized it he embraced it alas it was his dear friend dupont was instantly drawn from the water and le Heroux obtained for his unfortunate comrade again a place upon the raft those who had been most inveterate against him touched at what providence had done for him in so miraculous a manner decided with one accord to allow him entire liberty upon the raft 
the sixty unfortunates who had escaped from the first massacre were soon reduced to fifty then to forty and at last to twenty-eight the least murmur or the smallest complaint at the moment of distributing the provisions was a crime punished with immediate death in consequence of such a regulation it may easily be presumed the raft was soon lightened in the meanwhile the wine diminished sensibly and the half rations very much displeased a certain chief of the conspiracy on purpose to avoid being reduced to that extremity the executive power decided it was much wiser to drown thirteen people and to get full rations than that twenty-eight should have half rations merciful heaven what a shame after the last catastrophe the chiefs of the conspiracy fearing doubtless of being assassinated in their turn threw all the arms into the sea and swore an inviolable friendship with the heroes which the hatchet had spared on the seventeenth of july in the morning captain parnajan commandant of the argus brig still found fifteen men on the raft they were immediately taken on board and conducted to senegal four of the fifteen were yet alive viz captain dupont residing in the neighborhood of maintenanton lieutenant leheru since captain at senegal savigny at rochefort and Coriad, i know not where on the fifth of july at ten in the morning one hour after abandoning the raft and three after quitting the medusa m laperere the officer of our boat made the first distribution of provisions each passenger had a small glass of water and nearly the fourth of a biscuit each drank his allowance of water at one draught but it was found impossible to swallow one morsel of our biscuit it being so impregnated with sea water it happened however that some was found not quite so saturated of these we eat a small portion and put back the remainder for a future day our voyage would have been sufficiently agreeable if the beams of the sun had not been so fierce on the evening we perceived the shores of the desert but as the two chiefs messrs schmaltz and Larchmaris, wished to go right for senegal notwithstanding we were still one hundred leagues from it we were not allowed to land several officers remonstrated both on account of our want of provisions and the crowded condition of the boats for undertaking so dangerous a voyage others urged with equal force that it would be dishonoring the french name if we were to neglect the unfortunate people on the raft and insisted we should be set on shore and whilst we wait there three boats should return to look after the raft and three to the wreck of the frigate to take up the seventeen who were left there as well as a sufficient quantity of provisions to enable us to go to senegal by way of barbary but messrs schmaltz and lechmaris whose boats were sufficiently well provisioned scouted the advice of their subalterns and ordered them to cast anchor till the following morning they were obliged to obey these orders and to relinquish their designs during the night a certain passenger who was doubtless no doctor and who believed in ghosts and witches was suddenly frightened by the appearance of flames which he thought he saw in the waters of the sea a little way from where our boat was anchored my father and some others who were aware that the sea is sometimes phosphorated confirmed the poor credulous man in his belief and added several circumstances which fairly turned his brain they persuaded him the arabic sorcerers had fired the sea to prevent us from travelling along their deserts on the morning of the sixth of july at five o'clock all the boats were under way on the route to senegal the boats of messrs schmaltz and lachamaris took the lead along the coasts and all the expedition followed about eight several sailors in our boat with threats demanded to be set on shore but m lapierre not acceding to their request the whole were about to revolt and seize the command but the firmness of this officer quelled the mutineers in a spring which he made to seize a firelock which a sailor persisted in keeping in his possession he almost tumbled into the sea my father fortunately was near him and held him by his clothes but he had instantly to quit him for fear of losing his hat which the waves were floating away a short while after this slight accident the shallop which we had lost sight of since the morning appeared desirous of rejoining us we plied all hands to avoid her for we were afraid of one another and thought that that boat encumbered with so many people wished to board us to oblige us to take some of its passengers as m espiel would not suffer them to be abandoned like those upon the raft 
that officer hailed us at a distance offering to take our family on board adding he was anxious to take about sixty people to the desert the officer of our boat thinking that this was a pretense replied we preferred suffering where we were it even appeared to us that m espial had hid some of his people under the benches of the shallop but alas in the end we deeply deplored being so suspicious and of having so outraged the devotion of the most generous officer of the medusa our boat began to leak considerably but we prevented it as well as we could by stuffing the largest holes with oakum which an old sailor had had the precaution to take before quitting the frigate at noon the heat became so strong so intolerable that several of us believed we had reached our last moments the hot winds of the desert even reached us and the fine sand with which they were loaded had completely obscured the clearness of the atmosphere the sun presented a reddish disk the whole surface of the ocean became nebulous and the air which we breathed depositing a fine sand an impalpable powder penetrated to our lungs already parched with a burning thirst in this state of torment we remained till four in the afternoon when a breeze from the northwest brought us some relief notwithstanding the privations we felt and especially the burning thirst which had become intolerable the cool air which we now began to breathe made us in part forget our sufferings the heavens began again to resume the usual serenity of those latitudes and we hoped to have passed a good night a second distribution of provisions was made each received a small glass of water and the eighth part of a biscuit notwithstanding our meagre fare every one seemed content in the persuasion we would reach senegal by the morrow but how vain were all our hopes and what sufferings had we yet to endure at half past seven the sky was covered with stormy clouds the serenity we had admired a little while before entirely disappeared and gave place to the most gloomy obscurity the surface of the ocean presented all the signs of a coming tempest the horizon on the side of the desert had the appearance of a long hideous chain of mountains piled on one another the summits of which seemed to vomit fire and smoke bluish clouds streaked with dark copper color detached themselves from that shapeless heap and came and joined with those which floated over our heads in less than half an hour the ocean seemed confounded with the terrible sky which canopied us the stars were hid suddenly a frightful noise was heard from the west and all the waves of the sea rushed to founder our frail bark a fearful silence succeeded to the general consternation every tongue was mute and none durst communicate to his neighbor the horror with which his mind was impressed at intervals the cries of the children rent our hearts at that instant a weeping and agonized mother bared her breast to her dying child but it yielded nothing to appease the thirst of the little innocent who pressed it in vain o oh, night of horrors what pen is capable to paint thy terrible picture how describe the agonizing fears of a father and mother at the sight of their children tossed about and expiring of hunger in a small boat which the winds and waves threatened to engulf at every instant having full before our eyes the prospect of inevitable death we gave ourselves up to our unfortunate condition and addressed our prayers to heaven the winds growled with the utmost fury the tempestuous waves arose exasperated in their terrific encounter a mountain of water was precipitated into our boat carrying away one of the sails and the greater part of the effects which the sailors had saved from the medusa our bark was nearly sunk the females and the children lay rolling in its bottom drinking the waters of bitterness and their cries mixed with the roaring of the waves and the furious north wind increased the horrors of the scene my unfortunate father then experienced the most excruciating agony of mind the idea of the loss which the shipwreck had occasioned to him and the danger which still menaced all he had held dearest in the world plunged him into a swoon the tenderness of his wife and children recovered him but alas his recovery was to still more bitterly deplore the wretched situation of his family he clasped us to his bosom he bathed us with his tears and seemed as if he was regarding us with his last looks of love every soul in the boat was seized with the same perturbation but it manifested itself in different ways one part of the sailors remained motionless in a bewildered state the other cheered and encouraged one another 
the children locked in the arms of their parents wept incessantly some demanded drink vomiting the salt water which choked them others in short embraced as for the last time intertwining their arms and vowing to die together in the meanwhile the sea became rougher and rougher the whole surface of the ocean seemed a vast plain furrowed with huge blackish waves fringed with white foam the thunder growled around us and the lightning discovered to our eyes all that our imagination could conceive most horrible our boat beset on all sides by the winds and at every instant tossed on the summit of mountains of water was very nearly sunk in spite of our every effort in bailing it when we discovered a large hole in its poop it was instantly stuffed with everything we could find old clothes sleeves of shirts shreds of coats shawls useless bonnets everything was employed and secured us as far as it was possible during the space of six hours we rode suspended alternately between hope and fear between life and death at last towards the middle of the night heaven which had seen our resignation commanded the floods to be still instantly the sea became less rough the veil which covered the sky became less obscure the stars again shone out and the tempest seemed to withdraw a general exclamation of joy and thankfulness issued at one instant from every mouth the winds calmed and each of us sought a little sleep while our good and generous pilot steered our boat on a still very stormy sea the day at last the day so desired entirely restored the calm but it brought no other consolation during the nights the currents the waves and the winds had taken us so far out to sea that on the dawning of the seventh of july we saw nothing but sky and water without knowing whither to direct our course for our compass had been broken during the tempest in this hopeless condition we continued to steer sometimes to the right sometimes to the left until the sun arose and at last showed us the east on the morning of the seventh of july we again saw the shores of the desert notwithstanding we were a great distance from it the sailors renewed their murmurings wishing to get on shore with the hope of being able to get some wholesome plants and some more palatable water than that of the sea but as we were afraid of the moors their request was opposed however m Lapierre proposed to take them as near as he could to the first breakers on the coast and when there those who wished to go on shore should throw themselves into the sea and swim to land eleven accepted the proposal but when we had reached the first waves none had the courage to brave the mountains of water which rolled between them and the beach our sailors then betook themselves to their benches and oars and promised to be more quiet for the future a short while after a third distribution was made since our departure from the medusa and nothing more remained than four pints of water and one half dozen biscuits what steps were we to take in this cruel situation we were desirous of going on shore but we had such dangers to encounter however we soon came to a decision when we saw a caravan of moors on the coast we then stood a little out to sea according to the calculation of our commanding officer we would arrive at senegal on the morrow deceived by that false account we preferred suffering one day more rather than be taken by the moors of the desert or perish among the breakers we had now no more than a small half glass of water and the seventh of a biscuit exposed as we were to the heat of the sun which darted its rays perpendicularly on our heads that ration though small would have been a great relief to us but the distribution was delayed to the morrow we were then obliged to drink the bitter sea-water ill as it was calculated to quench our thirst must i tell it thirst had so withered the lungs of our sailors that they drank water saltier than that of the sea our numbers diminished daily and nothing but the hope of arriving at the colony on the following day sustained our frail existence my young brothers and sisters wept incessantly for water the little laura aged six years lay dying at the feet of her mother her mournful cries so moved the soul of my unfortunate father that he was on the eve of opening a vein to quench the thirst which consumed his child but a wise person opposed his design observing that all the blood in his body would not prolong the life of his infant one moment the freshness of the night wind procured us some respite we anchored pretty near to the shore and though dying of famine each got a tranquil sleep on the morning of the eighth of july at break of day 
we took the route for Senegal. A short while after the wind fell, and we had a dead calm. We endeavored to row, but our strength was exhausted. A fourth and last distribution was made, and in the twinkling of an eye, our last resources were consumed. We were forty-two people who had to feed upon six biscuits and about four pints of water, with no hope of a farther supply. Then came the moment for deciding whether we were to perish among the breakers, which defended the approach to the shores of the desert, or to die of famine in continuing our route. The majority preferred the last species of misery. We continued our progress along the shore, painfully pulling our oars. Upon the beach were distinguished several downs of white sand and some small trees. We were thus creeping along the coast, observing a mournful silence, when a sailor suddenly exclaimed, Behold the moors! We did, in fact, see various individuals upon the rising ground, walking at a quick pace, and whom we took to be the Arabs of the desert. As we were very near the shore, we stood farther out to sea, fearing that these pretended Moors, or Arabs, would throw themselves into the sea, swim out, and take us. Some hours after, we observed several people upon an eminence, who seemed to make signals for us. We examined them attentively, and soon recognized them to be our companions in misfortune. We replied to them by attaching a white handkerchief to the top of our mast. Then we resolved to land at the risk of perishing among the breakers, which were very strong towards the shore, although the sea was calm. On approaching the beach, we went towards the right, where the waves seemed less agitated, and endeavored to reach it with the hope of being able more easily to land. Scarcely had we directed our course to that point when we perceived a great number of people standing near to a little wood surrounding the sand hills. We recognized them to be the passengers of that boat, which, like ourselves, were deprived of provisions. Meanwhile, we approached the shore, and already the foaming surge filled us with terror. Each wave that came from the open sea, each billow that swept beneath our boat, made us bound into the air, so we were sometimes thrown from the poop to the prow, and from the prow to the poop. Then, if our pilot had missed the sea, we would have been sunk the waves would have thrown us aground, and we would have been buried among the breakers. The helm of the boat was again given to the old pilot, who had already so happily steered us through the dangers of the storm. He instantly threw into the sea the mast, the sails, and everything that could impede our proceedings. When we came to the first landing point, several of our shipwrecked companions, who had reached the shore, ran and hid themselves behind the hills, not to see us perish, Others made signs not to approach at that place. Some covered their eyes with their hands. Others, at last despising the danger, precipitated themselves into the waves to receive us in their arms. We then saw a spectacle that made us shudder. We had already doubled two ranges of breakers, but those which we had still to cross raised their foaming waves to a prodigious height, then sunk with a hollow and monstrous sound, sweeping along a long line of the coast. Our boat, sometimes greatly elevated and sometimes engulfed between the waves, seemed, at the moment, of utter ruin. Bruised, battered, and tossed about on all hands, it turned of itself and refused to obey the kind hand which directed it. At that instant, a huge wave rushed from the open sea and dashed against the poop. The boat plunged, disappeared, and we were all among the waves. Our sailors, whose strength had returned at the presence of danger, redoubled their efforts, uttering mournful sounds. Our bark groaned, the oars were broken, and it was thought aground, but it was stranded, it was upon its side. The last sea rushed upon us with the impetuosity of a torrent. We were all up to the neck in water, the bitter sea froth choked us, the grapnel was thrown out. The sailors threw themselves into the sea, they took the children in their arms, returned, and took us upon their shoulders, and I found myself seated upon the sand on the shore, by the side of my stepmother, my brothers and sisters, almost dead. Every one was upon the beach except my father and some sailors, but that good man arrived at last to mingle his tears with those of his family and friends. Instantly our hearts joined in addressing our prayers and praises to God. I raised my hands to the heaven, and remained some time immovable upon the beach. Everyone also hastened to testify his gratitude to our old pilot, who next to God justly merited the title of our preserver. 
M. Dumege, a naval surgeon, gave him an elegant gold watch, the only thing he had saved from the Medusa. Let the reader now recollect all the perils to which we had been exposed in escaping from the wreck of the frigate to the shores of the desert, all that we had suffered during our four days' voyage, and he will perhaps have a just notion of the various sensations we felt on getting on shore on that strange and savage land. Doubtless the joy we experienced at having escaped, as by a miracle, the fury of the floods was very great, but how much was it lessened by the feelings of our horrible situation? Without water, provisions, and the majority of us nearly naked, was it to be wondered at that we should be seized with terror on thinking of the obstacles which we had to surmount, the fatigues, the privations, the pains and sufferings we had to endure, with the dangers we had to encounter in the immense and frightful desert we had to traverse before we could arrive at our destination? Almighty Providence, it was in thee alone I put my trust." After we had a little recovered from the fainting and fatigue of our getting on shore, our fellow sufferers told us they had landed in the forenoon and cleared the breakers by the strength of their oars and sails, but they had not all been so lucky as we were. One unfortunate person, too desirous of getting quickly on shore, had his legs broken under the shallop and was taken and laid on the beach and left to the care of Providence. M. Espieu, commander of the shallop, reproached us for having doubted him when he wished to board us to take our family along with him. It was most true he had landed sixty-three people that day. A short while after our refusal, he took the passengers of the yawl, who would infallibly have perished in the stormy nights of the sixth and the seventh. The boat named the Senegal, commanded by M. Mede, had made the shore at the same time with M. Espieu. The boats of Messrs. Schmaltz and Lachamaris were the only ones which continued the route for Senegal, while nine-tenths of the Frenchmen entrusted to these gentlemen were butchering each other on the raft or dying of hunger on the burning sands of Sahara. About seven in the morning a caravan was formed to penetrate into the interior for the purpose of finding some fresh water. We did accordingly find some at a little distance from the sea by digging among the sand everyone instantly flocked round the little wells, which furnished enough to quench our thirst. This brackish water was found to be delicious, although it had a sulphurous taste, its color was that of whey. As all our clothes were wet and in tatters, and as we had nothing to change them, some generous officers offered theirs. My stepmother, my cousin, and my sister were dressed in them. For myself, I preferred keeping my own. We remained nearly an hour beside our beneficent fountain, then took the route for Senegal, that is, a southerly direction, for we did not know exactly where that country lay. It was agreed that the females and children should walk before the caravan, that they might not be left behind. The sailors voluntarily carried the youngest on their shoulders, and everyone took the route along the coast. Notwithstanding, it was nearly seven o'clock, the sand was quite burning, and we suffered severely, walking without shoes, having lost them while landing. As soon as we arrived on the shore, we went to walk on the wet sand to cool us a little. Thus we traveled during all the night, without encountering anything but shells which wounded our feet. On the morning of the ninth, we saw an antelope on the top of a little hill, which instantly disappeared before we had time to shoot it. The desert seemed to our view one immense plain of sand, on which was not seen one blade of verdure. However, we still found water by digging in the sand. In the forenoon, two officers of marine complained that our family incommoded the progress of the caravan. It is true the females and the children could not walk so quickly as the men. We walked as fast as it was possible for us. Nevertheless, we often fell behind, which obliged them to halt till we came up. These officers, joined with other individuals, considered among themselves whether they would wait for us or to abandon us in the desert. I will be bold to say, however, that but few were of the latter opinion. My father, being informed of what was plotting against us, stepped up to the chiefs of the conspiracy and reproached them in the bitterest terms for their selfishness and brutality. The dispute waxed hot. Those who were desirous of leaving us drew their swords, and my father put his hand upon a poignard with which he provided himself on quitting the frigate. At this scene we threw ourselves in between them, conjuring him rather to remain in the desert with his family 
than seek the assistance of those who were perhaps less human than the moors themselves several people took our part particularly m bergnier captain of infantry who quieted the dispute by saying to his soldiers my friends you are frenchmen and i have the honor of being your commander let us never abandon an unfortunate family in the desert so long as we are able to be of use to them this brief but energetic speech caused those to blush who wished to leave us all then joined with the old captain saying that they would not leave us on condition we would walk quicker m bergnier and his soldiers replied they did not wish to impose conditions on those to whom they were desirous of doing a favor and the unfortunate family of picard were again on the road with the whole caravan about noon hunger was felt so powerfully among us that it was agreed upon to go to the small hills of sand which were near the coast to see if any herbs could be found fit for eating but we only got poisonous plants among which were various kinds of euphorbium convolvulaceus of a bright green carpeted the downs but on tasting their leaves we found them as bitter as gall the caravan rested in this place while several officers went farther into the interior they came back in about an hour loaded with wild purslane which they distributed to each of us everyone instantly devoured his bunch of herbage without leaving the smallest branch but as our hunger was far from being satisfied with this small allowance the soldiers and sailors betook themselves to look for more they soon brought back a sufficient quantity which was equally distributed and devoured upon the spot so delicious had hunger made that food to us for myself i declare i never eat anything with so much appetite in all my life water was also found in this place but it was of an abominable taste after this truly frugal repast we continued our route the heat was insupportable in the last degree the sands on which we trod were burning nevertheless several of us walked on these scorching coals without shoes and the females had nothing but their hair for a cap when we reached the seashore we all ran and laid down among the waves after remaining there some time we took our route along the wet beach on our journey we met with several large crabs which were of considerable service to us every now and then we endeavored to slake our thirst by sucking their crooked claws about nine at night we halted between two pretty high sand hills after a short talk concerning our misfortunes all seemed desirous of passing the night in this place notwithstanding we heard on every side the roaring of leopards we deliberated on the means of securing ourselves but sleep soon put an end to our fears scarcely had we slumbered a few hours when a terrible roaring of wild beasts awoke us and made us stand on our defense it was a beautiful moonlight night and in spite of my fears and the horrible aspect of the place nature never appeared so sublime to me before instantly something was announced that resembled a lion this information was listened to with the greatest emotion every one being desirous of verifying the truth fixed upon something he thought to be the object one believed he saw the long teeth of the king of the forest another was convinced his mouth was already open to devour us several armed with muskets aimed at the animal and advancing a few steps discovered the pretended lion to be nothing more than a shrub fluctuating in the breeze however the howlings of ferocious beasts had so frightened us being yet heard at intervals that we again sought the seashore on purpose to continue our route towards the south some of our companions were desirous of making observations in the interior and they did not go in vain they instantly returned and told us they had seen two arab tents upon a slight rising ground we instantly directed our steps thither we had to pass great downs of sand very slippery and arrived in a large plain streaked here and there with verdure but the turf was so hard and piercing we could scarcely walk over it without wounding our feet our presence in these frightful solitudes put to flight three or four more shepherds who herded a small flock of sheep and goats in an oasis at last we arrived at the tents after which we were searching and found in them three morrises and two little children who did not seem in the least frightened by our visit a negro servant belonging to an officer of marine interpreted between us and the good women who when they had heard of our misfortune offered us millet and water for payment we bought a little of that grain at the rate of thirty pence a handful the water was got for three francs a glass it was very good and none grudged the money it cost 
as a glass of water with a handful of millet was but a poor dinner for famished people my father bought two kids which they would not give him under twenty piastres we immediately killed them and our morrises boiled them in a large kettle while our repast was preparing my father who could not afford the whole of the expense got others to contribute to it but an old officer of marine who was to have been captain of the port of senegal was the only person who refused notwithstanding he had about him nearly three thousand francs which he boasted of in the end several soldiers and sailors had seen him count it in round pieces of gold on coming ashore on the desert and reproached him for his sordid avarice but he seemed insensible to their reproaches nor eat the less of his portion of the kid with his companions in misfortune end of chapter thirteen chapter fourteen of thrilling narratives of mutiny murder and piracy this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by mary maxwell thrilling narratives of mutiny murder and piracy by anonymous chapter fourteen wreck of the french frigate medusa on the arguin bank part three when about to resume our journey we saw several moors approaching us armed with lances our people instantly seized their arms and put themselves in readiness to defend us in case of an attack two officers followed by several soldiers and sailors with our interpreter advanced to discover their intentions they instantly returned with the moors who said that far from wishing to do us harm they had come to offer us their assistance and to conduct us to senegal this offer being accepted of with gratitude by all of us the moors of whom we had been so afraid became our protectors and friends verifying the old proverb there are good people everywhere as the camp of the moors was at some considerable distance from where we were we set off altogether to reach it before night after having walked about two leagues through the burning sands we found ourselves again upon the shore towards night our conductors made us strike again into the interior saying we were near their camp which is called in their language Berkelet. but the short distance of the moors was found very long by the females and the children on account of the downs of sand which we had to ascend and descend every instant also of prickly shrubs over which we were frequently obliged to walk those who were barefelted felt most severely at this time the want of their shoes i myself lost among the bushes various shreds of my dress and my feet and legs were all streaming with blood at length after two hours of walking and suffering we arrived at the camp of that tribe to which belonged our arab conductors we had scarcely got into the camp when the dogs the children and the moorish women began to annoy us some of them threw sand in our eyes others amused themselves by snatching at our hair on pretense of wishing to examine it this pinched us that spit upon us the dogs bit our legs whilst the old harpies cut the buttons from the officers coats or endeavored to take away the lace our conductors however had pity on us and chased away the dogs and the curious crowd who had already made us suffer as much as the thorns which had torn our feet the chiefs of the camp our guides and some good women at last set about getting us some supper water in abundance was given us without payment and they sold us fish dried in the sun and some bowls full of sour milk at a reasonable price we found a moor in the camp who had previously known my father at senegal and who spoke a little french as soon as he recognized him he cried tiens toi picard n'y a pas connaître moi emet hark ye picard know you not emet we were all struck with astonishment at these french words coming from the mouth of a moor my father recollected having employed long ago a young goldsmith at senegal and discovering the moor emet to be the same person shook him by the hand after that good fellow had been made acquainted with our shipwreck and to what extremities our unfortunate family had been reduced he could not refrain from tears and this perhaps was the first time a mussulman had ever wept over the misfortunes of a christian amet was not satisfied with deploring our hard fate he was desirous of proving that he was generous and humane and instantly distributed among us a large quantity of milk and water free of any charge 
he also raised for our family a large tent of the skins of camels cattle and sheep because his religion would not allow him to lodge with christians under the same roof the place appeared very dark and the obscurity made us uneasy ahmet and our conductors lighted a large fire to quiet us and at last bidding us good night and retiring to his tent said sleep in peace the god of the christians is also the god of the mussulman we had resolved to quit this truly hospitable place early in the morning but during the night some people who had probably too much money imagined the moors had taken us to their camp to plunder us they communicated their fears to others and pretending that the moors who had walked up and down among their flocks and cried from time to time to keep away the ferocious beasts had already given the signal for pursuing and murdering us instantly a general panic seized all our people and they wished to set off forthwith my father although he well knew the perfidy of the inhabitants of the desert endeavored to assure them we had nothing to fear because the arabs were too frightened for the people of senegal who would not fail to avenge us if we were insulted but nothing could quiet their apprehensions and we had to take the route during the middle of the night the moors being soon acquainted with our fears made us all kinds of protestations and seeing we persisted in quitting the camp offered us asses to carry us as far as the senegal these beasts of burden were hired at the rate of twelve francs a day for each head and we took our departure under the guidance of those moors who had before conducted us to the camp ahmet's wife being unwell he could not accompany us but recommended us strongly to our guides my father was able to hire only two asses for the whole of our family and as it was numerous my sister caroline my cousin and myself were obliged to crawl along whilst my unfortunate father followed in the suite of the caravan which in truth went much quicker than we did a short distance from the camp the brave and compassionate captain bernier seeing we still walked obliged us to accept of the ass he had hired for himself saying he would not ride when young ladies exhausted with fatigue followed on foot the king afterwards honorably recompensed this worthy officer who ceased not to regard our unfortunate family with a care and attention i will never forget during the remainder of the night we travelled in a manner sufficiently agreeable mounting alternately the ass of captain bernier at five in the morning of the eleventh of july we regained the seashore our asses fatigued with the long journey among the sand ran instantly and lay down among the breakers in spite of our utmost exertions to prevent them this caused several of us to take a bath we wish not i myself held under my ass in the water and had great difficulty in saving one of my young brothers who was floating away but in the end as this incident had no unfortunate issue we laughed and continued our route some on foot and some on the capricious asses towards ten o'clock perceiving a ship out at sea we attached a white handkerchief to the muzzle of a gun waving it in the air and soon had the satisfaction of seeing it was noticed the ship having approached sufficiently near the coast the moors who were with us threw themselves into the sea and swam to it it must be said we had very wrongfully supposed that these people had had a design against us for their devotion could not appear greater than when five of them darted through the waves to endeavor to communicate between us and the ship notwithstanding it was still a good quarter of a league distance from where we stood on the beach in about half an hour we saw these good moors returning making float before them three small barrels arrived on shore one of them gave a letter to m s Bu from m parnajan this gentleman was the captain of the argus brig sent to seek after the raft and to give us provisions this letter announced a small barrel of biscuit a tierce of wine a half tierce of brandy and a dutch cheese o oh, fortunate event we were very desirous of testifying our gratitude to the generous commander of the brig but he instantly set out and left us we staved the barrels which held our small stock of provisions and made a distribution each of us had a biscuit about a glass of wine a half glass of brandy and a small morsel of cheese each drank his allowance of wine at one gulp the brandy was not even despised by the ladies i however preferred quantity to quality and exchanged my ration of brandy for that of wine to describe our joy while taking this repast is impossible exposed to the fierce rays of a vertical sun exhausted by a long train of suffering deprived for a long while the use of any kind of spirituous liquors when our portions of water wine and brandy mingled in our stomachs we became like insane people 
life which had lately been a great burden now became precious to us foreheads lowering and sulky began to unwrinkle enemies became most brotherly the avaricious endeavored to forget their selfishness and cupidity the children smiled for the first time since our shipwreck in a word every one seemed to be born again from a condition melancholy and dejected i even believe the sailors sung the praises of their mistresses this journey was the most fortunate for us some short while after our delicious meal we saw several moors approaching who brought milk and butter so that we had refreshments in abundance it is true we paid a little dear for them the glass of milk cost not less than three francs after reposing about three hours our caravan proceeded on its route about six in the evening my father finding himself extremely fatigued wished to rest himself we allowed the caravan to move on while my stepmother and myself remained near him and the rest of the family followed with their asses we all three soon fell asleep when we awoke we were astonished at not seeing our companions the sun was sinking in the west we saw several moors approaching us mounted on camels and my father reproached himself for having slept so long their appearance gave us great uneasiness and we wished much to escape from them but my stepmother and myself fell quite exhausted the moors with long beards having come quite close to us one of them alighted and addressed us in the following words be comforted ladies under the costume of an arab you see an englishman who is desirous of serving you having heard at senegal that frenchmen were thrown ashore upon these deserts i thought my presence might be of some service to them as i was acquainted with several of the princes of this arid country these noble words from the mouth of man we had first taken to be a moor instantly quieted our fears recovering from our fright we rose and expressed to the philanthropic englishman the gratitude we felt mr carnet the name of the generous briton told us that our caravan which he had met waited for us at about the distance of two leagues he then gave us some biscuit which we ate and we then set off together to join our companions mr carnet wished us to mount his camels but my stepmother and myself being unable to persuade ourselves we could sit securely on their hairy haunches continued to walk on the moist sand whilst my father mr carnet and the moors who accompanied him proceeded on the camels we soon reached a little river called in the country margot de maragoines we wished to drink of it but found it as salt as the sea mr carnet desired us to have patience and we should find some at the place where our caravan waited we forded that river knee deep at last having walked about an hour we rejoined our companions who had found several wells of fresh water it was resolved to pass the night in this place which seemed less arid than any we saw near us the soldiers being requested to go and seek wood to light a fire for the purpose of frightening the ferocious beasts which were heard warring around us refused but mr carnet assured us that the moors who were with him knew well how to keep all such intruders from our camp in truth during the whole of the night these good arabs promenaded round our caravan uttering cries at intervals like those we had heard in the camp of the generous Ahmet. We passed a very good night, and at four in the morning continued our route along the shore. Mr. Carnet left us to endeavor to procure some provisions. Till then our asses had been quite docile, but annoyed with their riders so long upon their backs they refused to go forward. A fit took possession of them, and all at the same instant threw their riders on the ground or among the bushes. The Moors, however, who accompanied us, assisted to catch our capricious animals, who had nearly scampered off and replaced us on the hard backs of these headstrong creatures. At noon the heat became so violent that even the Moors themselves bore it with difficulty. We then determined on finding some shade behind the high mounds of sand which appeared in the interior. But how were we to reach them? The sands could not be hotter. We had been obliged to leave our asses on the shore, for they would neither advance nor recede. The greater part of us had neither shoes nor hats, notwithstanding we were obliged to go forward almost a long league to find a little shade. The heat reflected by the sands of the desert could be compared to nothing but the mouth of an oven at the moment of drawing out the bread. Nevertheless, we endured it, but not without cursing those who had been the occasion of all our misfortunes arrived behind the heights for which we searched we stretched ourselves under the mimos gomier the acacia of the desert several broke branches of the asclepia swallow wort and made themselves a shade 
but whether from want of air or the heat of the ground on which we were seated we were nearly all suffocated i thought my last hour was come already my eyes saw nothing but a dark cloud when a person of the name of burner who was to have been a smith at senegal gave me a boot containing some muddy water which he had had the precaution to keep i seized the elastic vase and hastened to swallow the liquid in large draughts one of my companions equally tormented with thirst envious of the pleasure i seemed to feel and which i felt effectually drew the foot from the boot and seized it in his turn but it availed him nothing the water which remained was so disgusting that he could not drink it and spilled it on the ground captain bernier who was present judging by the water which fell how loathsome this must have been which i drank offered me some crumbs of biscuit which he kept most carefully in his pocket i chewed that mixture of bread dust and tobacco but i could not swallow it and gave it all masticated to one of my young brothers who had fallen from inanimation we were about to quit this furnace when we saw our generous englishman approaching who brought us provisions at this sight i felt my strength revive and cease to desire death which i had before called on to release me from my sufferings several moors accompanied mr carnet and every one was loaded on their arrival we had water with rice and dried fish in abundance every one drank his allowance of water but had not ability to eat although the rice was excellent we were all anxious to return to the sea that we might bathe ourselves and the caravan put itself on the road to the breakers of sahara after an hour's march of great suffering we regained the shore as well as our asses who were lying in the water we rushed among the waves and after a bath of half an hour we reposed ourselves upon the beach my cousin and i went to stretch ourselves upon a small rising ground where we were shaded with some old clothes which we had with us my cousin was clad in an officer's uniform the lace of which strongly attracted the eyes of mr carnet's moors scarcely had we laid down when one of them thinking we were asleep came to endeavor to steal it but seeing we were awake contented himself by looking at us very steadily about three in the morning a northwest wind having sprang up and a little refreshed us our caravan continued its route our generous englishman again taking the task of procuring us provisions at four o'clock the sky became overcast and we heard thunder in the distance we all expected a great tempest which happily did not take place near seven we reached the spot where we were to wait for mr carnet who came to us with a bullock he had purchased then quitting the shore we went into the interior to seek a place to cook our supper we fixed our camp beside a small wood of acacias near to which were several wells or cisterns of fresh water our ox was instantly killed skinned cut to pieces and distributed a huge fire was kindled and each was occupied in dressing his meal at this time i caught a smart fever notwithstanding i could not help laughing at seeing every one seated round a large fire holding his piece of beef on the point of his bayonet a sabre or some sharp pointed stick the flickering of the flames on the different faces sunburned and covered with long beards rendered more visible by the darkness of the night joined to the noises of the waves and the roaring of ferocious beasts which we heard in the distance presented a spectacle at once laughable and imposing while these thoughts were passing across my mind sleep overpowered my senses being awakened in the middle of the night i found my portion of beef in the shoes which an old sailor had lent me for walking among the thorns although it was a little burned and smelt strongly of the dish in which it was contained i ate a good part of it and gave the rest to my friend the sailor that seaman seeing i was ill offered to exchange my meat for some which he had had the address to boil in a small tin box i prayed him to give me a little water if he had any and he instantly went and fetched me some in his hat my thirst was so great that i drank it out of his nasty hat without any repugnance at nine o'clock we met upon the shore a large flock herded by young moors these shepherds sold us milk and one of them offered to lend my father an ass for a knife which he had seen him take out of his pocket my father accepted the proposal the moor left his companion to accompany us as far as senegal from which we were yet two good leagues suddenly we left the shore our companions appearing quite transported with joy some of us ran forward and having gained a slight rising ground discovered the senegal at no great distance we hastened our march and for the first time since our shipwreck 
a smiling picture presented itself to our view. The trees always green, with which that noble river is shaded, the hummingbirds, the red birds, the parquets, the promerops, etc., who flitted among their long yielding branches, caused in us emotions difficult to express. We could not satiate our eyes with gazing on the beauties of this place, verdure being so enchanting to the sight, especially after having traveled through the desert. Before reaching the river, we had to descend the little hill covered with thorny bushes. My ass, stumbling, threw me into the midst of one, and I tore myself in several places, but was easily consoled when I at length found myself on the banks of a river of fresh water. Everyone having quenched his thirst, we stretched ourselves under the shade of a small grove, while the beneficent Mr. Carnet and two of our officers set forward to Senegal to announce our arrival, and to get us boats. In the meanwhile, some took a little repose, and others were engaged in dressing the wounds with which they were covered. At two in the afternoon, we saw a small boat beating against the current of the stream with oars. It soon reached the spot where we were. Two Europeans landed, saluted our caravans, and inquired for my father. One of them said he came on the part of Messrs. Artique and Labour, inhabitants of Senegal, to offer assistance to our family. The other added that he had not waited for the boats which were getting ready for us at the island of St. Louis, knowing too well what would be our need. We were desirous of thanking them, but they instantly ran off to a boat and brought us provisions, which my father's old friends had sent him. They placed before us a large basket containing several loaves, cheese, a bottle of Madeira, a bottle of filtered water, and dresses for my father. Everyone who, during our journey, had taken any interest in our unfortunate family, and especially the brave Captain Bernier, had a share of our provisions. We experienced a real satisfaction in partaking with them, and giving them the small mark of our gratitude. A young aspirant of Marine, who had refused us a glass of water in the desert, pressed with hunger, begged us some bread. He got it, also a small glass of Madeira. It was four o'clock before the boats of the government arrived, and we all embarked. Biscuit and wine were found in each of them, and all were refreshed. That in which our family was commanded by M. R. T., captain of the port, and one of those who sent us provisions. My father and he embraced as two old friends who had not seen one another for eight years, and congratulated themselves that they had been permitted to meet once more before they died. We had already made a league upon the river when a young navy clerk, M. Molien, was suddenly taken ill. We put him ashore and left him to the care of a negro to conduct him to Senegal when he should recover. It would be in vain for me to paint the various emotions of my mind at that delicious moment. I am bold to say all the colony, if we accept Messrs. Schmaltz and Lachemaris, were at the port to receive us from our boats. M. R. T., going on shore first to acquaint the English governor of our arrival, met him coming to us on horseback, followed by our generous conductor, Mr. Carnet, and several superior officers. We went on shore carrying our brothers and sisters in our arms. My father presented us to the English governor, who had alighted. He appeared to be sensibly affected with our misfortunes. The females and children chiefly excited his commiseration and the native inhabitants and Europeans tenderly shook the hands of the unfortunate people. The negro slaves even seemed to deplore our disastrous fate. The governor placed the most sickly of our companions in a hospital. Various inhabitants of the colony received others into their houses. M. R. T. obligingly took charge of our family. Arriving at his house, we there found his wife, two ladies, and an English lady, who begged to be allowed to assist us. Taking my sister Caroline and myself, she conducted us to her house, and presented us to her husband, who received us in the most affable manner, after which she led us to her dressing room, where we were combed, cleansed, and dressed by the domestic negresses, and were most obligingly furnished with linen from her own wardrobe, the whiteness of which was strongly contrasted with our sable countenances. In the midst of my misfortunes, my soul had preserved all its strength, but this sudden change of situation affected me so much that I thought my intellectual faculties were forsaking me. We were so confused by our agitation that we scarcely heard the questions which were put to us, having constantly before our eyes the foaming waves and the immense track of sand over which we had passed. The following is the substance abridged from Messrs. Corriard and Savigny, 
of what took place on the raft during thirteen days before the sufferers were taken up by the argus brig after the boats had disappeared the consternation became extreme all the horrors of thirst and famine passed before our imagination besides we had to contend with a treacherous element which already covered the half of our bodies the deep stupor of the soldiers and sailors instantly changed to despair all saw their inevitable destruction and expressed by their moans the dark thoughts which brooded in their minds our words were at first unavailing to quiet their fears which we participated with them but by which a greater strength of mind enabled us to dissemble at last an unmoved countenance and our proffered consolations quieted them by degrees but could not entirely dissipate the terror with which they were seized when tranquillity was a little restored we began to search about the raft for the charts the compass and the anchor which we presumed had been placed upon it after what we had been told at the time of quitting the frigate these things of the first importance had not been placed upon our machine above all the want of a compass the most alarmed us and we gave vent to our rage and vengeance m Coriad then remembered he had seen one in the hands of the principal workman under his command he spoke to the man who replied yes yes i have it with me this information transported us with joy and we believed that our safety depended upon this futile resource it was about the size of a crown piece and very incorrect those who have not been in situations in which their existence was exposed to stream peril can have but a faint knowledge of the price one attaches then to the simplest objects with what avidity one seizes the slightest means capable of mitigating the rigor of that fate against which they contend the compass was given to the commander of the raft but an accident deprived us of it forever it fell and disappeared between the pieces of wood which formed our machine we had kept it but a few hours and after its loss had nothing to guide us but the rising and setting of the sun we had all gone afloat without taking any food hunger beginning to be imperiously felt we mixed our paste of sea biscuit with a little wine and distributed it thus prepared such was our first meal and the best we had during our stay upon the raft an order accompanying to our numbers was established for the distribution of our miserable provisions the ration of wine was fixed at three quarters a day we will speak no more of the biscuit it having been entirely consumed at the first distribution the day passed away sufficiently tranquil we talked of the means by which we would save ourselves we spoke of it as a certain circumstance which reanimated our courage and we sustained that of the soldiers by cherishing in them the hope of being able in a short time to revenge themselves on those who had abandoned us this hope of vengeance it must be avowed equally animated us all and we poured out a thousand imprecations against those who had left us a prey to so much misery and danger the officer who commanded the raft being unable to move m savigny took it upon himself to duty of erecting the mast he caused them to cut in two one of the poles of the frigate's masts and fixed it with the rope which had been served to tow us and of which we made stays and shrouds it was placed on the anterior third of the raft we put up for a sail the main top gallant which trimmed very well but was of very little use except when the wind served from behind and to keep the raft in this course we were obliged to trim the sail as if the breeze blew athwart us in the evening our hearts and our prayers by a feeling natural to the unfortunate were turned towards heaven surrounded by inevitable dangers we address that invisible being who has established and who maintains the order of the universe our vows were fervent and we experienced from our prayers the cheering influence of hope it is necessary to have been in similar situations before one can rightly imagine what a charm is the sublime idea of a god protecting the unfortunate to the heart of the sufferer one consoling thought still soothed our imaginations we persuaded ourselves that the little divisions had gone to the isle of arguin and that after it had set a part of its people on shore the rest would return to our assistance we endeavored to impress this idea on our soldiers and sailors which quieted them the night came without our hope being realized the wind freshened and the sea was considerably swelled what a horrible night the thought of seeing the boats on the morrow a little consoled our men the greater part of whom being unaccustomed to the sea fell on one another at each movement of the raft 
M. Savigny, seconded by some people who still preserve their presence of mind amidst the disorder, stretched cords across the raft by which the men held, and were better able to resist the swell of the sea. Some were even obliged to fasten themselves. In the middle of the night the weather was very rough. Huge waves burst upon us, sometimes overturning us with great violence. The cries of the men mingled with the flood, whilst the terrible sea raised us at every instance from the raft and threatened to sweep us away. This scene was rendered still more terrible by the horrors inspired by the darkness of the night. Suddenly we believed we saw fires in the distance at intervals. We had had the precaution to hang at the top of the mast the gunpowder and pistols which we had brought from the frigate. We made signals by burning a large quantity of cartridges. We even fired some pistols. But it seems the fire we saw was nothing but an error of vision, or perhaps nothing more than the sparkling of the waves. We struggled with death during the whole of the night, holding firmly by the ropes which were made very secure. Tossed by the waves from the back to the front, and then from the front to the back, and sometimes precipitated into the sea, floating between life and death, mourning our misfortunes, certain of perishing, we disputed, nevertheless, the remainder of our existence with that cruel element which threatened to engulf us. Such was our condition till daybreak. At every instant were heard the lamentable cries of the soldiers and sailors. They prepared for death, bidding farewell to one another, imploring the protection of heaven, and addressing fervent prayers to God. Everyone made vows to him, in spite of the certainty of never being able to accomplish them. Frightful situation! How is it possible to have any idea of it which will not fall far short of the reality? Towards seven in the morning the sea fell a little, the wind blew with less fury, but what a scene presented itself to our view. Ten or twelve unfortunates, having their inferior extremities fixed in the openings between the pieces of the raft, had perished by being unable to disengage themselves. Several others were swept away by the violence of the sea. At the hour of repast we took the numbers anew. We had lost twenty men. We will not affirm that this was the exact number, for we perceived some soldiers who, to have more than their share, took rations for two, and even three. We were so huddled together that we found it absolutely impossible to prevent this abuse. In the midst of these horrors, a touching scene of filial piety drew our tears. Two young men raised and recognized their father, who had fallen and was lying insensible among the feet of the people. They believed him at first dead, and their despair was expressed in the most affecting manner. It was perceived, however, that he still breathed, and every assistance was rendered for his recovery in our power. He slowly revived and was restored to life and to the prayers of his sons, who supported him closely folded in their arms. Whilst our hearts were softened by this affecting episode in our melancholy adventures, we had soon to witness the sad spectacle of a dark contrast. Two shipboys and a baker feared not to seek death, and threw themselves into the sea, after having bid farewell to their companions in misfortune. Already the minds of our people were singularly altered. Some believed that they saw land, others ships which were coming to save us, all talked aloud of their fallacious visions. We lamented the loss of our unfortunate companions. At this moment we were far from anticipating the still more terrible scene which took place on the following night. Far from that we enjoyed a positive satisfaction so well were we persuaded that the boats would return to our assistance. The day was fine and the most perfect tranquility reigned all the while on our raft. The evening came and no boats appeared. Despondency began again to seize our men, and then a spirit of insubordination manifested itself in cries of rage. The voice of the officers was entirely disregarded. Night fell rapidly in. The sky was obscured by dark clouds. The wind, which during the whole day had blown rather violently, became furious and swelled the sea, which in an instant became very rough. The preceding night had been frightful, but this was more so. Mountains of water covered us at every instant, and burst with fury into the midst of us. Very fortunately we had the wind from behind, and the strongest of the sea was a little broken by the rapidity with which we were driven before it. We were impelled towards the land. The men, from the violence of the sea, were hurried from the back to the front. We were obliged to keep to the center, 
the firmest part of the raft, and those who could not get there almost all perished. Before and behind the waves dashed impetuously, and swept away the men in spite of all their resistance. At the center the pressure was such that some unfortunates were suffocated by the weight of their comrades, who fell upon them at every instant. The officers kept by the foot of the little mast, and were obliged every moment to call to those around them to go to one or the other side to avoid the waves, for the sea coming nearly athwart us gave our raft nearly a perpendicular position, to counteract which they were forced to throw themselves upon the side raised by the sea. The soldiers and sailors, frightened by the presence of almost inevitable danger, doubted not that they had reached their last hour. Firmly believing they were lost, they resolved to sue their last moments by drinking till they lost their senses. We had no power to oppose this disorder. They seized a cask which was in the center of the raft, made a little hole in the end of it, and with small tin cups each took a pretty large quantity, but they were obliged to cease, for the sea water rushed into the hole they had made. The fumes of the wine failed not to disorder their brains, already weakened by the presence of danger and want of food. Thus excited, these men became deaf to the voice of reason. They wished to involve, in one common ruin, all their companions in misfortune. They avowedly expressed their intention of freeing themselves from their officers, who they said wished to oppose their design, and then to destroy the raft by cutting the ropes which united its different parts. Immediately after they resolved to put their plans into execution, one of them advanced upon the side of the raft with a boarding axe, and began to cut the cords. This was the signal of revolt. We stepped forward to prevent these insane mortals, and he who was armed with the hatchet, with which he even threatened an officer, fell the first victim. A stroke of a saber terminated his existence. End of chapter 14